Paul Simon sang about someone who had them on the soles of her shoes. But a collection of unlikely fortune hunters living on the west coast have little time for such romantic notions. Diamonds are their ticket to a better, wealthier life. McFarlane braved the heat and dust to bring us a story that might change how you see artisanal mining. This is a story about adventurers, pioneering spirits who have given up their comfort zones in search of that one in a million jackpot. But in order for me to tell the story, I need to go on a bit of an adventure myself. 1,300 kilometers to the other side of the country. The journey takes us along the N14, through Northwest to the Northern Cape, past some familiar towns, all the way to Plainsia on the West Coast. It's hard to imagine that just 20 years ago, Plainsia was a bustling little town. It was established in 1942 as a private alluvial diamond mining settlement. And in its heyday, about 4,000 people used to live here. And now it's used as a sleepy stopover for tourists. What brings you here? Peace, quiet, tranquility. Mm -hmm. um, stayed in Gauteng for way too long. How long have you been here? I've been here for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah my, my vrouw is from Komogas. Yeah. Ian Koster and J.P. de Jager live here in Kleinsia, a small Namakoland coastal town known mainly for spectacular springtime flowers and diamonds. I had a business in uh, Gauteng, which I was running from here. Mm -hmm. And when lockdown came, obviously travel bans, you couldn't go anywhere. So, yeah, you need some food on the table. Mm -hmm. And I met up with some guys who own a mine just outside of town. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, look, I'd like to start working, try and find my fortune if I'm lucky. Yeah. And the guy said, well, you're more than welcome. And just like that, the security man from Centurion gave up his business to pursue a very different dream. Once you've done your first concentrate and you wash it and you take the pan and you turn it over and you see that little glittering thing, you get goosebumps just thinking about it. It's you you like a five-year-old kid. Yeah that sees this massive present underneath the Christmas tree, and it's a little motorbike. You know those ones, those, yeah, those yeah. plastic ones? <laughs> it's like that. It's, and every single time from that day on, when you see it, that's the feeling you get. The area between Alexander Bay to Olifant's Refir Mouth in the south is rich in alluvial diamonds, and these have been transported from Kimberley to the coast over a period of 80 million years. And it's these diamonds that have called many an adventurer to this part of the world. I think it's just natural, all of these are miners, so that's the best part of the world. JP is a man with a checkered past, but these days he works for one of the remaining big diamond mining companies in the area in an open pit mine. Ian has a concession agreement with a local mine just outside Klenzia where he does what is called bedrock sweeping. He basically digs into the sand until he finds potholes of gravel in the bedrock. Is it hard work though? Oh, yes. Oh, Blood, yes. sweat and tears. Blood, sweat and tears. We work 12-hour days. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we have heat, especially in the summers of about 55 degrees. What? Yes. But then there's a southwest wind that comes in and it brings a bit of a cool breeze. But the sun is still yeah. killing. But we don't have anything in the house, you don't have anything. It's not so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you guys are, yeah. The first alluvial diamond in Namakoland was found in 1925 near Port Nolith. And within a year, thousands of hopeful diggers rushed to the area. But the government stepped in and restricted the industry. And although the terrestrial mineral rights were mostly monopolized by De Beers and other big mining giants, individual prospectors looked at the ocean with a glint in their eye. What is it that you guys do? What do you do? Just on yourself. Yeah, we try to get the sea Johan Katsia trained as a diver in the Navy in the early 70s. Toen was ik eigenlijk op pad walvis baai te gewees om op die visbote te gaan werk met ek het gery loop en toe tel ou my op en toe vertel hy my van die diamant dikery op die kus. Toe ek maar hier begin te werk destijds. On and off for over 40 years, Johan has been diving for diamonds. Yeah, I guess now we're 10, 12 years back here, so 
Ja, dat is ook wel een geval van die weet, is, uh, um, ons is niet opgeleid hoor, eigenlijk in enige ander beroep nie, ek meen ons is duikers, jy weet, so, honest. Ek denk om jou aan, as jy eerst die man te geduik het en jy, jy het verlief geraak daarop, dan kom jy maar altyd terug. Ja. And it is this dream that also lured om Willy van Rooyen and his family to the West Coast almost 50 years ago. We're on our way deep into the Namakwa National Park. Wimvili is taking us to the spot where they started their adventure, but the road ahead is a sandy two-track. Because it's a bit of a sandy road, you've got to let out a bit of pressure, otherwise we'll be slipping and sliding all over the place, and uh, I don't want to get stuck here, especially not at night. It's a bumpy ride down to Spuchrefier Caves. Almost feels like you're in a boat on the choppy sea. This is the place the young Willy pitched his tent when he first arrived in Namakoland. We had our tent so to get out. And we had the clips and the gates to use for us to get out of our boots and to sit. The use of pumps to suck up the gravel from the ocean floor was introduced around the time Willy arrived here with his father and brother. All over the place, people were building these diamond pumps, diamond pumps. But um, Willy, at this time, you're a fisherman, from Zululand. You know nothing about diamonds. Who's teaching you all of this? No, it's common sense. Or, uh, <laughs> kans fat. Yeah, kans fat and common sense. Willy also learned very early on that diving for diamonds is very hard work. You start diving seven o'clock in the morning, and you come up, have a cup of tea, eat a few raisins or whatever, and then you go down the hour and a half, come up, eat a few raisins, hour and a half, two hours, and you come up till about three o'clock in the afternoon. Then, then you're fed up, you're cold and you're tired and all that, then you come back home. Tomorrow morning you go again. Operating like a giant vacuum cleaner, the pump and compressor are either on land or on a boat, while the diver enters the water with a long suction hose, extracting the gravel from the seabed, sometimes 20 to 30 meters below. We didn't know anything about decompression and time you have to dive because you're diving deeper than 10 meters. Mm -hmm. We just went down and dived till you get cold and you come up again. <laughs> <laughs> As you drive through these lonely plains and almost alien landscape, you can see the damage that mining has done to the environment. But when you start speaking to the people and hearing their stories, you see that there's a whole lot more that's actually changed. As the mining companies scaled down and moved out of the area, it gave the opportunity for so-called artisanal miners to move in, looking for their share of the riches. That is for us then to say, all right, we are workers, we have the work, we are miners, so we are now dick. The Bontaku mine, just inland from Clainsia, has been occupied by illegal miners for almost a decade. And at the moment, Stain Crew is the man in charge here. But it's artisanal mining, right? It's artisanal mining, yes. From the air, it looks like a giant termite nest. Miners are digging tunnels into the earth. They run the risk of tunnel cave-ins, which happen all too regularly and endure harsh working conditions, all in the name of making money. You can see here, so it's now from the grease from the old ones that now have been brought. They now have been grease brought, so they're just sacks that now are ready to be then the richie gets to work. But now, how do you know? Wiese grijs is wiese na. All right, elke een ou eet sy hoopie. So die grijse raak nie dier makkie. Waar kree hulle die hoopies? Hulle gaan, ja, oorals waar hulle nou gaan myn. In the jig, the gravel is washed and separated. The waste is expelled and the potential diamond containing concentrate is caught in a series of sieves. Dan as het nou klaar gewas is, dan word die sieve uitgehaal en dan word hulle nou daar, ons noem het die tafel. Dan word hulle op die tafel uitgegooi, yes. En dan word hulle nou geblaai en dan kyk hulle vir die... Die diamanten die steen. Hoe blij jylle? Hylle gebruik sommer een mes. Hoekom gebruik jylle een mes? Dit is maar een van ons tools. Ok. Ja, hy lig hem baie makkeliker so met die mes uit. Van as jy hem nou met die vinger vat, dan druk jy nou die ander diamanten ook. Ja, ja. So dit is ook om die mes net een baie beter is. En omdat die mes moes maar een deel is van jou tool wat jy saam mee. Maar die mes lek jy vir diamanten. Dit is een bult om mes. And sometimes the effort pays off. Harder work for him. They're so clean. Would you um, do anything else? Right now? Mm. No, I still need to find the one with my name on. <laughs> yeah. You, you, that, that, that 20 character? No. 
It's a 40.02. Uh -huh. I've dreamt of it four times. Four I times. just don't know where it is. <laughs> You've got two, two choices. Or you come in with diamond, or you play horses. <laughs> it's the same thing. You're going to lose money anyway. And perhaps that realization is worth more than the precious stones concealed in this unforgiving place, knowing that while not everyone who dreams big makes it big, there's value to be found in the search. Thank you for watching our stories here online and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.